Okay. Uh, our celebrated speaker today is Professor George Luger. Um, I've, he, George doesn't remember me, but that was just a big squeak graduate student 35 years ago at UNM. And I used to hang out at the computer science department and other people, and also electrical engineering department. Um, that was in the mid to late eighties. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, George has um, celebrated history with AI and you can look at his website, uh, books on AI. One of them is uh, sixth edition, um, another book, um, a fifth edition, I think some of them are downloadable. So you can actually get to read them if you wish. Uh, been consulted to many firms, including the US government, the national labs, Los Alamos and Bia and so on. Has uh, 16 PhD students plus two in the pipeline, 100 plus papers, and I'm gonna stop here. And George is gonna tell us about his personal uh, experience with AI and Saying that, I'll give him the podium, George. Well, um, thanks, Joe. I, I'm always nervous when people start using the word celebrated, but <laughs> we'll just have to deal with that. Um, when I talked to Joe about this uh, a few weeks ago, he asked me to sort of tell the story of a second generation AI person. And what I mean by that, I'll go into in just a minute. Uh, so that's in fact what I'll do. Uh, I'll also uh, mention where I think the current uh, big interests are in, in artificial intelligence and kind of summarize those a little bit near the end. One of the reasons uh, I asked Joe to make my resume available is because I don't intend to go down into the weeds on any of the topics that I'm talking about tonight. But if you're interested, you can get uh, write-ups from the papers that I'll, uh, I'll refer you to uh, as we go along. Um, so what do you mean by a second generation AI person? Well, as you know, the Dartmouth uh, workshop in 1956 was sort of the starting point for AI. There were a few people that were building chess playing programs, checker playing programs, logic proving programs before 1956. And these were the ones along with several others like information theory people and so on that were uh, brought to the 1956 uh, Dartmouth workshop where uh, John McCarthy and a number of the other early people picked the name of AI and laid out 10 or 12, uh, 10 or 12 concerns that he thought the AI uh, research community uh, would be addressing as it went forward. Um, I consider myself second generation because I was taught by the people that were uh, in the uh, uh, original AI workshop. I got to know a whole lot of them over the years. Uh, 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 Marvin Minsky, Seymour Papert. I went to their labs at MIT and worked with their students. Uh, Woody Bledsoe, UT Austin doing automated reasoning. John McCarthy at Stanford doing logic. Uh, I was an editor to a couple of his papers that were published later. Ed Feigenbaum at Stanford, the beginner, the person that started the rule-based expert systems. Uh, Niels Nielsen, also at Stanford, he wrote the first AI text I took in my first AI class, which was just over 50 years ago. So uh, that's, that's quite, a, quite a bit of time. Anyway, I see myself as second generation just because I'm sort of the, the product of the people that began AI and uh, um, that's kind of where I sit myself. The, that group I see is coming like in the next 15 years or so after the 56 Dartmouth conference. I was also lucky enough to work with several people that uh, were at Bletchley Park with uh, Alan Turing in the uh, uh, early 1940s and uh, helped break the Enigma code. Donald Mickey was with me at Edinburgh and he was one of uh, Alan Turing's, uh, Turing's research 
assistant. So that's kind of where I, I sit in the uh, collection of, of AI people. Um, I uh, grew up in uh, Spokane, Washington, went to uh, Jesuit High School where we had uh, a bunch of mathematics and uh, fell in love with mathematics, felt that that would be my, my study area, went to Gonzaga U, took a couple of philosophy classes and I got uh, uh, a master's degree in applied mathematics and went to Notre Dame and got a master's degree in theoretical mathematics. Uh, I was in a PhD program, but at that time I kind of figured that math majors weren't getting hired. And when they did get hired, they were insurance actuarials or worked for small colleges or whatever. So I decided to switch to uh, computer science and I went to University of Pennsylvania at that time. One of the things that also uh, I, I found part of my informative years was, uh, was uh, reading um, the cybernetics uh, book uh, that uh, came out in the 50s or so. Uh, what's his name wrote that? I'll remember. Uh, winner. Winner. Uh, yeah. Winner. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and that was that was important, but mainly I wanted to get a degree in something related to computing, so I switched it to University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I went there in 1969. It was the year after Noam Chomsky had left Penn and gone to MIT, and Penn was really pretty linguistics oriented. Uh, a lot of uh, computing was taught from the language uh, focus. I don't know if you all remember, but it's a fact that computing wasn't very often taught on the undergraduate level. Carnegie Mellon at the time didn't even have a major in computer science. They sort of started computing at the master's level. And so some of the things my students were taking in their sophomore year at University of New Mexico, I had as a second year graduate student. So. Uh, but, but all along, I think the mathematical foundation was the important thing. I had a lot of logic courses. Uh, I was working in non-abelian algebras when I was at Notre Dame, and uh, we had all sorts of cool geometry classes about uh, non-Euclidean spaces and a bunch of other really fun things. I took some statistics courses at University of Washington and, and so on. Anyway, I was a high school teacher when the Sputnik thing happened, and that funded my, my graduate school. So I went to uh, a year at Notre Dame and uh, my PhD work in uh, University of Pennsylvania on Sputnik scholarships. We have to thank the Russians for that. I can remember those days when the Russians put Sputnik up and America just got really weird simply because they weren't in that space period. So they put a lot of money on the table and uh, I think put it to good use trying to get people like myself that were going to be teachers uh, into some graduate school and learning computing and learning mathematics and and so on. So I'm, I'm kind of a, a Sputnik kid. Uh, the uh, nice thing about University of Pennsylvania at, time, at that time, the product also of the 1960s is it was very interdisciplinary. And we could literally put together a uh, PhD if we could find three faculty people that would be on our committee. And what that committee would do would take the responsibility for writing our uh, comprehensive exams and lining up our proposal and sitting through our, 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 our PhD defense. It was, it was kind of nice because I came with a lot of mathematics and I wanted to do computing. And I'd also been really interested in psychology, especially cognitive psychology. Uh, uh, like 
good now and Austin and those people and, and also developmental psychology like Piaget and uh, some, of the, some of those research areas. So my PhD is in the arts, of, arts and sciences uh, with three threads in it, uh, mathematics, uh, psychology, and computation. For my actual PhD, I uh, wrote some computational models for humans doing puzzles. I did a lot of tests of uh, human subjects solving different groups of puzzles, uh, modeled it on uh, state space representation, uh, looked at the graph-based applications of symmetry and subproblem decompositions and uh, my dissertation was to try to th understand the effects of subproblem decompositions and symmetries in uh, in human human problem solving. So, in a way, it was kind of a real AI uh, dissertation at the time, trying to model cognitive phenomena with computational tools. Uh, I had an interview for Jet Propulsion Labs where they were working on some space robotics, but I also had a, a chance to go to University of Edinburgh and be a postdoc research fellow in the AI department. And that was the best decision I ever made it, uh, besides going to Penn. Well, actually besides marrying the woman I did. Um, uh, going to University of Edinburgh, uh, was again a, a interdisciplinary situation. It was by far the best uh, AI consortium in in Europe at the time, and uh, I was able to continue running human subjects and modeling their performance in the in the psychology labs. Uh, I worked with people in linguistics. I worked with people that were in animal studies trying to get uh, primates to solve different problems like seriation and uh, color matching and things like that. And uh, uh, I work primarily in the artificial intelligence department of uh, the University of Edinburgh. My starting salary was 3,300 pounds a year, which is just under 5,000 a year. Uh, on the other hand, we had excellent health care. We had our first two kids over there and living was really quite comfortable in, in that uh, European environment, uh, especially in Edinburgh. Edinburgh sometimes is called the Athens of the North. <laughs> it's got a storied history of uh, philosophy and mathematics and uh, uh, computation as we saw it going in. I worked in David Hume Tower, which was named, of course, after the philosopher who I think contributed an awful lot towards our understanding of uh, the role of causality and whatever that might mean. Um, uh, was the, uh, uh, I have a question. Was, was Ian Wright still at Edinburgh when you were there? Was who? E. M. Wright, the mathematician. Um, yes, he was. I, I I didn't know him. I didn't I didn't do much work with uh, with uh, with the math department. That was one group that was uh, pretty uh, pretty pretty far distant uh, from us at the time. But yes, he was there. Um, also, uh, a, a certain uh, religious uh, uh, English uh, person, uh, Mr. Bayes, was uh, a, a big figure in University of Edinburgh. Bayes got his uh, degree there, and as you know, they didn't. He didn't publish Bayes' theorem until after he had died. It had appeared in the Royal Society proceedings, but. Uh, Bayes took his mathematics at uh, Edinburgh. So um, it was quite an exciting place to be. Uh, I worked primarily, um, I started out working for Bernard Meltzer 
and Donald Mickey, who was the uh, colleague of, uh, of Alan Turing. Uh, but my first research support came working with Alan Bundy and automated reasoning. Uh, we uh, put together a, a, a proposal uh, that we called uh, MECO, M-E-C-H-O, for the Mechanics Oracle. Now, what that did is it took problems in applied mathematics. I don't know if, how many of you are, are, are know what goes on in some of the British secondary schools, but they have a lot of applied math problems, like uh, blocks sliding down inclined planes and systems of pulleys that work together and all that sort of physics. And our goal was to uh, model or to, to make a, to design algorithms that could solve these problems. And uh, one of the ways we did it, and this was kind of my primary role, was to uh, interview successful students and try to understand how they did it. Uh, this, was, this was sort of a important part of early AI. Uh, Newell and Simon did this at, uh, at Carnegie Mellon or Carnegie Institute at that time, uh, when they built the logic theorists, they took a lot of subjects that didn't know any logic and they gave them these puzzles and said, what do you do? What are you gonna do here? And uh, they would struggle through and eventually solve some problems. But meanwhile, they identified some heuristics that they later called things like uh, means ends analysis and that sort of thing that they, implemented on the computer when they made the logic theorists that as you all know, proved uh, most of the first two books of Russell and Whitehead's Principia. Uh, so we did the same thing. We brought in human subjects that were good at this. And uh, one of the things that struck us is what they knew, the expertise they had with them coming to the uh, Coming, coming in to solve the problem. They knew things like if no uh, coefficient of friction is mentioned, the system's supposed to be assumed to be frictionless. If no angle is mentioned in the way pulleys are configured, uh, the weights are vertical. Uh, uh, just a lot of common sense uh, stuff that they picked up by solving a lot of phys uh, applied mass problems. And that was kind of our role. We teased that out of them and then built things that I called schemas, which reflected the knowledge that these uh, expert subjects had. And basically they were just rules and relationships, several of which I mentioned about friction and uh, that sort of stuff. and these were built into data structures. And what would happen is when we would take the uh, English description of a problem, uh, it would trigger appropriate schemas that would call in relations that were important for the problem. And you could go from there to ask the subject different things about the problem if you needed more information. So this was the primary uh, thing I worked on for for um, my second and third and uh, and fourth year at at Edinburgh. Incidentally, we built this uh, thing <laughs> in uh, Prolog. This was one of the first major uses of logic programming. Uh, Bob Kowalski was there, who uh, had a lot to do with. Uh, marketing logic programming. Uh, David Warren and Fernando Pereira were, were there at the time who wrote the first uh, prologue book on using prologue. David, of course, David Warren uh, uh, wrote the, the WAM architecture for interpreting prologue. That's the Warren abstract machine. And uh, it was really, it was really pretty exciting time in prologue. Alan Robinson, who you know, uh, created resolution uh, inference system was a periodic visitor at University of Edinburgh. In fact, he had an office next to mine and he'd talk about the different ways that prologue could be looked at and, and, and so on. 
it was it was really primitive when we got it from Marseille and France. They'd used it a little bit for doing language understanding, but uh, uh, you know, error messages consisted of things like debordment, de peel, debordment, de tab. <laughs> In other words, you just blown your stack <laughs> and you had to figure out what the heck had gone wrong with it. So we went through times where we'd have like 30 feet of printout paper along the long corridors and be crawling along on our hands and knees trying to read reams of prologue stuff. It was really pretty primitive. We started off with teletype machines and uh, uh, printers and uh, the 1970s weren't a, a easy interface time at all. Anyway, that's the sort of work we did. I brought uh, a tape with uh, Warren's uh, prologue back to the US, met some Japanese folks that were traveling in the early 70s and they took it to Japan and that became the uh, heart of their fifth generation computing project, if any of you are old enough to remember that. It was a big thing in the 1990s. They wanted to do logic programming in the large as what they called their fifth generation project. Anyway, that was kind of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the sort of, well, it was the sort of work that, uh, that, that we did at the time. Um, uh, We also were excited by some of the readings at the time, like, like a lot of you. We uh, read uh, Thomas Kuhn's the, or uh, the Origins of Scientific Revolutions and thought that was really exciting. You know, you start at that age thinking you're going to be at the core of some great breakthrough. But what you really realize is that he's right about what science is. And you really learn about what science is in the small, even though you're uh, hoping someday you'll uh, be able to, to take the next step in, uh, in uh, the evolution of how we understand ourselves in the world. So uh, Kuhn's work and that sort of stuff was always a driver in those early years. Uh, Edinburgh was a, a key place for, like I said, AI uh, in all of Europe and we had some very uh, interesting people who would step by for a year, a sabbatical or whatever. Uh, Michael Arbib, uh, who I became a friend of, was there for a year. And uh, 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 George Lakoff was there uh, working on some of his ideas. Uh, Yorick Welks, uh, of course, spent uh, uh, a year and a bit with us doing his natural language understanding thing. And I already mentioned uh, Alan Robinson with his uh, resolution uh, inference system that was the uh, heart of uh, modern prologue. So um, the other thing that was, like I said, that was really, really nice is that we're again in a interdisciplinary environment and uh, you know, sometimes when people ask me, you know, give me a def definition of AI. Sure, I can go back to John McCarthy's early thing in the 50, 56 workshop, Dartmouth workshop, where he said, you know, it's trying to build uh, programs that people, when looked at, think produce intelligent results. But I'm a little more broad than that. I'd say, you know, this is too young a discipline to try to put boundaries on. It's just a set of people that are doing fun stuff and uh, hopefully, uh, well, maybe not hopefully, maybe it doesn't need to come together like physics has come together or math has come together. Uh, it's a pretty exciting, pretty diverse uh, area where nothing is really out of bounds except stuff that steps away from the scientific method, of course. Uh, the other thing that I uh, say is that, that very few people are trying to make this automated general intelligence, you know, the, the, full, uh, 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 the full deal, the full intelligent as in intelligent 
uh, humans. Uh, we're trying to make things that are useful, that help people live better, that can deliver medical care, that can support space vehicles as AI tools have supported space vehicles that can, uh, like I say, deliver medical care, recommendations, uh, whatever. A lot of, a lot of useful stuff without trying to be uh, uh, totally gee whiz. In fact, sometimes when we get a little bit too into the, I can do that, we'll play chess in the next 10 years. We kind of make fools of ourselves because things don't happen quite that fast. I know uh, uh, Herb Simon, uh, I think it was uh, in the 1960s said we'd have uh, chess players in a decade. Well, you know, we did get a chess player, but it was like 30 years later that uh, 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 machine learning had advanced a lot and uh, 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 parallel uh, systems for doing board positions and all that just made uh, stuff possible that simply couldn't be conceived of in the 1960s. Anyway, also one, one of the things that was exciting about living in, in Europe was the fact that we're close to a lot of places. Once my research uh, started working, I gave talks at the University of Paris, I gave talks in Cambridge, I gave talks in Oxford, University of London, University of Geneva, M Milan Polytechnic, uh, Pisa, uh, uh, Piaget's Institute for Semantic and Cognitive Studies in Geneva. You're just really close by a lot of fun places and uh, it's easy to hang out and make relationships with, uh, with different uh, research organizations. I continued my work with several people at Edinburgh afterwards and I had like uh, 12 years of NATO support to go back and forth working at Edinburgh. This was specifically with people in the psychology department where I was working with uh, Tom Bauer in uh, developmental psychology where we published some papers modeling the development stages of infant, infant object recognition. Uh, these papers are on my resume if you want to look at them. I worked uh, with Brendan McGonigal trying to model aspects of primate behavior and, and that sort of stuff. So that's kind of the Edinburgh story and we can talk about it more later if, if it's interesting to you when you look at my resume, sort of the things that were published between 73 and 82 were, were Edinburgh related stuff. In 79, 1979, I came to the University in New Mexico. One of the things I decided being at an Ivy League university is that uh, I didn't want to go through the tenure nonsense in a place like that where they ride you hard and turn you out wet. And uh, I just wanted to teach kids and continue my own research. So when a position came up at University of New Mexico, I was one of six faculty that uh, started the uh, computer science program there. We started that in uh, the beginning of 1980. We got a uh, big uh, DARPA grant. We were one of the first nodes on the internet that connected the East Coast and the West Coast. I guess they had to have a couple in the middle. So Utah and UNM were sort of between MIT and Stanford on the old uh, uh, ARPANET. It was ARPA before it was DARPA. And uh, just was part of building a department there. I had made friends in the psychology department. And over the years, we built a program in cognitive science where we had several students do research topics uh, related to modeling aspects of human performance. Uh, I have faculty friends in the linguistics department. I have a joint appointment there and I established the program in computational linguistics, which we taught for years and is still pretty active. I'm working with students still on that, really some interesting stuff. Uh, so again, it's interdisciplinary and it's, teaching smart kids and doing cool stuff and hopefully in enjoying myself without getting rousted at tenure time. 
Um, the uh, uh, as I came into University of New Mexico and started teaching AI, I realized there wasn't really any. Uh, this this sounds this this sounds grandiose, uh, but let me try it on you. There wasn't any really unified theory of AI uh, for for general teaching kids. You could either go to uh, uh, Nielsen at the Stanford approach and do kind of a logic-based approach, or you could go to uh, Winston's book at MIT and do kind of a hacker's approach to AI. And I'd always been a fan of people like Newell and Simon that were in the middle and the emerging and the emerging work in expert systems. So in, in 1988, I wrote the first edition of my AI book, which was called Artificial Intelligence Structures. And no, it was called How to Build Expert Systems, I think. Later, we just changed it to Structures and Strategies for Complex Problem Solving. But the goal of the AI book was just to try to tie the community together and uh, try to get out of the uh, East Coast, West Coast camps and make something that uh, normal normal kids could understand. The other thing is that University of New Mexico, you know, we have a lot of what you'd call normally intelligent kids. You know, they don't come into college with four or five years of computing and mathematics. We sort of take our diverse community wherever they are and try to push them as far as we can. So a lot of my AI book is just general algorithms. What's depth first, breadth first, best first search, iterative deepening search, A star search, alpha beta, minimax, uh, onward and onward. Uh, logic, how can you use logic in programming? Uh, what's a semantic network? How can you capture relations in language with semantic network technology? What's it good for? What's a neural network? What were the first neural networks? How do they work? You know, all this sort of fundamental basic stuff and uh, fortunately, as the department grew, we'd have more faculty that could, including myself, that would teach advanced topics. But the main gist of my AI book that's gone through six editions and translated into half a dozen different languages, including Russian and Chinese and German, has just been to teach normal computational techniques that support the art of artificial intelligence enterprise. Um, the, uh, so that's, that's kind of my story. I, re, I retired, I uh, went from active teaching about half a dozen years ago. I thought I could get out when I was 71, but we had a failed department head search. So the Dean asked me to stick around the department head, which I avoided successfully for the previous, uh, 32 years, uh, but so I was department head for a year and a half before I quit, but I still have students. And I, over the years, because of my AI work, I've been lucky enough to consult for a whole bunch of companies, everything from uh, uh, working in Israel to the Netherlands, to uh, pharmacy in Sweden, to uh, just a whole lot of Philips and Eindhoven, just a whole lot of different exciting places to find out, uh, to help people learn the basics of AI and how it can be used in, in building their, their, different, their different products. So uh, that's kind of where I've been. Uh, just recently, I've been working in, in deep learning with a, a company doing intellectual property. We're trying to take, uh, say a particular, uh, uh, patent description and find all the uh, intellectual property re related to that patent, which of course is uh, an interesting task when you have over 100 million patents. Uh, but we've used aspects of deep learning and that sort of stuff to uh, 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 find patent relationships and all that sort of stuff. Uh, also keep working in natural language. Like I said, I worked with companies trying to do web bots for communicating on the web with people that wanna uh, get a password changed or 
want to buy a plane ticket or whatever. And that's, that's kind of been fun for me uh, over the years. Um, so uh, before we're done, let me, let me take a quick uh, uh, um, statement of where I think AI is right now. There's really four areas as I see it. The first of all, the first of course is the uh, symbol-based approach that's uh, uh, kind of uh, made, uh, its notoriety came from the physical symbol system hypothesis written by Newell and Simon in their 1976 Turing Award lecture. Uh, it's the heart of the rule-based expert systems. It's the heart of a lot of uh, uh, important reasoning, logic-based reasoning. And it works really well when you know what, when you, can when you can determine what the knowledge is related to a specific domain, you can write it down and you can interpret it with a machine and you can solve a lot of good problems. It's worked on space vehicles to uh, do their guidance systems. It's used in robotics in the old days. And uh, even though now it's sometimes referred to dismissively as good old fashioned AI, I, I think the insight is that it's good for what it's good for. And if you know the technology and you know what it does, you won't be stupid in trying to use it. And a lot of the applications now where it's used aren't even considered AI anymore. They're just knowledge embedded in programs that uh, solve interesting problems. The second area I consider important is the connectionist or the neural net approach. It's probably the earliest form of AI given uh, the work of McCulloch and Pitts at MIT and uh, in the night in the 1940s and Donald Hebb also at MIT with his Hebbian reinforcement learning. Uh, Marvin Minsky's PhD thesis was uh, during, during neural, neural network, of course. And uh, um, of course, there's the perceptron, which was important. Who did that? Uh, wasn't Rochester. I forget, anyway. Rosenblatt, yeah, of course, thanks. Um, uh, it sort of went into disuse when Minsky and Papert wrote their book and uh, I believe it was about 68, we studied it at Penn and I think the funding also changed where symbol-based AI got a lot of money and, but neural network work continued in physics uh, where people were interested in uh, energy minimization and all that sort of sp stuff, uh, spin glass physics, some of those things. Uh, it emerged in AI again, of course, with the work in uh, uh, California, the PDP books that were written by Hinton and McClelland and Rommelard, I believe. And again, that demonstrated the importance of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of neural network work. I think the major work, the major breakthroughs, of course, there, there, there's a bunch of them uh, that made deep learning possible. The first ones, of course, came with the Boltzmann machine and then back propagation followed shortly after that. And of course, in the modern world, uh, uh, Benju, Lacunin, and uh, um, Jeffrey Hinton's work has made modern AI and deep learning possible. Um, the third area that I think is important, although it isn't, and I, it may be a bit of a dead end, is emergent computation. And this is sort of exemplified by uh, genetic algorithms, uh, uh, genetic programming. Uh, you know, John Holland created the uh, genetic algorithms at University of Michigan. I believe he started like in the late 60s. John Koza was at Stanford when he did genetic programming, and of course, artificial life and the things that follow out of life, uh, artificial life, some of the things like uh, artificial chemistry and biology, where you try to make new uh, components of our biological world with uh, the mutation and other algorithms that are part of uh, the A life 
and emergent repertoire. I'm not sure where that's going and what the huge future of it is, but it's interesting. A fellow named Langton uh, has been in charge of the journals in the artificial life community for a while, and you can see his work there. But probably the most important part of modern AI, in my humble opinion, is uh, stochastic modeling, uh, the uh, use of Bayes' theorem and its modern components. I think Bayes itself is really a powerful tool for understanding our world. I go back to my old psychological background and talk about schemas and interpreting new data where the prior knowledge that a system has can be seen as the schema knowledge or the knowledge the human expert has. The posterior information, of course, is what you're seeing right now, what you're perceiving and how you interpret it, of course, uh, uh, Reverend Bayes gives us a model for that. Uh, the major breakthrough, I think, I, I think Bayes by itself is, is not computable in most interesting situations. The breakthrough on that, of course, came with Judea Pearl's two or three books in the 90s, uh, his books, Causality and uh, uh, what's, I forget the names of his other books. Uh, uh, but what he did is showed us how to use uh, uh, belief networks, which make some simple assumptions on, on Bayes, uh, namely that you can't have cycles and namely that you have to represent your world as a directed graph. You, you uh, mean Judea Pearl, I think. Judea Pearl, yeah. That's what I said, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, he got a ACM Turing Award for uh, his work in, in uh, uh, probabilistic modeling. Uh, I think it's important in natural language understanding. It's important in complex modeling uh, situations. Uh, I've used it with my students in the last uh, decade or so. Uh, we had a contract for um, for uh, U.S. Navy's where we model breakdowns in the Navy uh, and helicopter rotor systems. We used a hidden Markov model that took all sorts of data and told them when to land the helicopter. It wasn't a combination of uh, temperature going high, vibrations uh, bad, whatever. It was just a combination of perceptual clues that uh, the, the system had been trained to recognize as possibly dangerous. So it wasn't rule-based, it was sort of perception-oriented. And again, we used a autoregressive hidden Markov model to track the state of the, the machine. Uh, another uh, system we built uh, was to model uh, uh, sodium-cooled uh, nuclear reactors for power generation. Uh, there's a, I did this with Sandia National Labs and in my recent papers, you can see, see what went on there. We use Markov logic networks, which is really a great combination of probabilistic reasoning and logic. We were able to implement the knowledge of the physics experts at Sandia and the tests we'd run to get probabilistic relationships about the quality of uh, the products and the connections in the system. And we were able to use Judea Pearl's uh, I, I counterpositive reasoning is what he calls it. Uh, I, I sort of refer to it as hypothetical reasoning, where you can say, what would happen if I put the fuel rods down at this point? And you can spin forward with your model in faster than real time and get answers to what would happen if you did that. You uh, call it counter, counterfactual. Counterfactual, yes, that's right. And it's, it's really cool, especially in an area where, uh, you know, where health and, and safety are important, like uh, understanding what the heck's going on in a, in a sodium-cooled nuclear reactor. Anyway, um, the other th last thing I want to mention is that uh, one, of my, uh, one of my beliefs in language is that, uh, that words are actually superfluous and that what we recognize is sound patterns that come out of other people. And uh, one of my students, Paul De Palma, and I built a system that would recognize human speech from sound patterns. 
and were, were able to take sound patterns and interpret the intent of the query without ever looking at words. And if you think about it, we used some of uh, uh, NIST tools that uh, uh, to help us get syllables and that sort of stuff out of voice speech. But if you think about it, the, the syllable error rate in language is a lot lower than the word error rate. For one thing, there's a hell of a lot less syllables out there. So uh, there's a whole lot less confusion or potential conflicts in, uh, in doing this. So we, were, we went directly from syllables to user's intent, which was, I thought, pretty cool. Anyway, so just a final couple words. Uh, what my book's about, I didn't intend Joe to have, have my book description there. It hasn't come out yet. It's supposed to come out later this month. Uh, what I look at is uh, how we humans know our world and try to use some of the tools from AI to help decipher uh, what's going on in the world, in particular probabilistic models and things like HMM and lo logic networks. Uh, I go through each of the four approaches to AI and try to tell where they're reasonable and successful and criticize them when they fail, uh, including deep learning. I have quite a bit on the limitations of deep learning. Uh, and uh, then I propose what I think is a appropriate ep epistemic stance for uh, understanding ourselves and our world. And that's what my book's going to be about when it comes out. I sent it to the, they went to the publisher and they did such a hash job on my symbols and having different fonts and stuff like that, that I had to, at the page proof level, I had to send it all back to be redone again because uh, they just, just hashed it up miserably. So hopefully it'll be out this month. Anyway, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed meeting you all. Didn't mean to talk so much. Maybe you have some questions. Uh, usually in uh, in regular talks, people clap, and I will clap for everybody. <laughs> Thank you, George. That was phenomenal. Uh, we have a couple of questions from Dan uh, Smith. Uh, the first one is, what was the surprise? Uh, uh, what surprised you most in AI or deep learning uh, during your career? And the second question is, what is the biggest jump in the science technology of AI, in your opinion? I... I there, there's several things. Uh, AI people have been terrible about overhyping different technologies. I can remember a time when everybody was doing case-based reasoning because that was the new flag that somebody had up in the air. Uh, I think the worst danger is, is, you know, believing our own nonsense too much periodically. What it does is causes long-term disbelief in in the technology. I like the fluidity between these different approaches. I've loved the symbolic approach. I thought it was really good for modeling aspects of human performance. I like the connectionist approach. I like what it's trying to do in deep learning. I, in my book, I go into some pretty good limitations on, uh, on where deep learning is. And uh, uh, above all, I'm sort of a probabilistic <laughs> logic network person. And I, I have a question on behalf of my colleagues, Faisal and Peter. Uh, we've been doing mixing AI neural networks with combinatorics, uh, especially combinatorial optimizations, very large graphs. Uh, I want to hear your opinion uh, of, of that. And why, don't, why do you think that more researchers haven't taken up on, um, on combining um, the deep learning methods, uh, the statistical learning with the combinatorial optimization route? I think that's a great question. Uh, as I said, I myself came out of a math background and, and, and most, of my, most of my PhD students, I sent over to the math department to get a good background in, in statistics and, and, and that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, a machine learning can simply be looked as advanced implementation of statistics. And part of the problem with machine learning is people don't understand what the hell they're doing. There's all these tools out there on the internet. You know, you, you have uh, 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 
Bert and uh, Roberta and all these tools that people just plug and play with and then they don't understand what the heck the results they got out of the system are. So my, my feeling is the more mathematics we have, the better. On the other hand, one of my criticisms is not enough mathematicians have gone into Judea Pearl's uh, approach to doing statistics, namely uh, the combinatorial wins you get with uh, Bayesian belief networks. I think that's a huge step forward that should be looked at more seriously by uh, statisticians. Well, if you uh, judge uh, the development of uh, Dirichlet processes in the 70s by Ferguson and the implementation of them to understanding text uh, by uh, people like Michael Jordan and others uh, just uh, 10 years ago, there's a lag. Uh, what is, in your opinion, uh, is the lag in being able to combine those different techniques uh, to create new methods and making breakthroughs? Uh, I, you know, I think it'll happen, but, but, but the fact is these are, these are serious uh, mathematical issues uh, and computational issues. I mean, things that came out of uh, vector processing and all this sort of stuff with deep learning really made all sorts of ideas actually computable. Uh, so I think it's a combination of understanding comp computation as well as being better at our mathematics. And uh, uh, I think this notion that you can do deep learning by plugging and playing is just going to lead you down a lot of rabbit holes where you won't even understand why you didn't get what you expected to get. You know, when you do science, part of, part of, part of it is the foundation of knowing that your experiment is grounded so that if your experiment fails, you know what the heck to do next. But if you're just pulling a package off the internet, plugging it in, uh, running some of your own data by it and uh, getting something out, uh, you know, you can always say, is it useful? But very seldom do you know how to make it any better or perhaps even know what it actually means. And I have one more question from Robert Johnson. And the question is, do you have any thoughts about Jeff Hawkins, the thousand brains theory and his thought about modeling the neocortex in cortical columns? You know, I, I love this stuff. Uh, and, and I'm glad to see people are willing to spend money trying some of it. You know, it just shows that we're kind of in an empirical discipline, you know, try it and see. Uh, I think people have to be aware of the complexity of the uh, human cortex. They have to be, and I go into this a little bit in my book, they have to be aware that there aren't just columns, that there are uh, like five different types of neuronal connections, each that do different things within the, the human system. Uh, um, you know, way back in the day at the beginning of the Lisp machine, I forget who, uh, there was a company that was doing this sort of stuff. Uh, you know, good for them. Uh, I don't think they're going to create anything resenting, representing human intelligence. I mean, we're conditioned by what we are. You know, we're, uh, we look at the earth from four or five feet off the ground. We're bipeds. We're born. We have kids. We're going to die. This is, this is all what makes things intelligent and meaningful for us. You know, we're not bots, we're not multi-column, multi-cortex, whatever. We're humans and intelligence, uh, our intelligence is uh, a function of, uh, of, of what we are. And you know, uh, uh, birds and airplanes can both fly and humans and computers can both be intelligent, but uh, it's a mistake to try to confuse it too. And uh, in in that, <laughs> uh, actually, uh, Robert Johnson has a follow-up. <laughs> it's the gift that keeps on giving. Is the pursuit of AGI a fool's errand? In other words, is that an impossible goal? And that would be the last question. Uh, I think it's a good goal. Why not? You know, artificial intelligence is basically whatever somebody has the energy and the money to do as long as they stick with the scientific method that makes experiments 
creates a foundation for their experiment so that when their experiments screw up, they know what to do next. If you can do that, I don't care if you're trying to make AGI or whatnot. In my humble opinion, why? You know, you're not going to make another human. Uh, you know, go out and have kids or something. Uh, but, you know, why not? If, if, if you want to spend your money that way, uh, that's fine. And, 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 you know, the other side of it is maybe in trying to make an AGI, we'll begin to understand ourselves a little better. Maybe we'll understand a little bit better how, how, how we work. And, you know, that's, that's hugely valuable. I think we all agree. <laughs> okay, so once again, I'd like to thank Professor George Luger and I'll clap for everybody. <laughs> thank you all. I've enjoyed meeting you and, and, and being with you for an hour. And good luck in your work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Prof. Bye bye. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.